Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert, and we're going to be discussing a very sensitive topic, but I think it's a very important one. It not only has its roots in not too distant history in America, or in our recent past, but it has stemmed back into prehistory, as far back into antiquity as we can possibly go, humans owning other humans or I'll say the word slavery. We're going to get into the term and what it means. And today, my guest, Dr. Jennifer Glancy, is going to help elucidate some of these ideas. She has written multiple books, and I'm going to promote those here in just a moment. But to give everybody a chance to enter into the stream, let's play a little intro that I think is a bit sensational, but it puts the finger on a very sensitive subject for Christianity itself. All right. When we hear the word slavery, Ben, we think of slavery as it existed in the American South. And as you know, that is nothing like the system that existed in ancient Israel. In ancient Israel, there was no social safety net sponsored by the state. There was no poverty program. So if a man got himself into a situation where he couldn't pay his debts, he could keep his family together and retain his self-respect by selling himself as an indentured servant to his creditor until he could work off his debts, and then he would have to be set free. After seven years, he had to be set free in any case. So this was really a form of indentured servanthood. It wasn't slavery as we think of that term. This was actually an anti-poverty program. And in some respects, I think it's better than what we have in modern Western culture, which destroys families, ruins people's self-respect because they're not working. Whereas in ancient Israel, a man retained his self-respect, he worked for an income, he paid his debts, he kept his family together. And that to call that slavery is just a gross misrepresentation. I think it's better than what we have. Ladies and gentlemen, the sensational intro is over, and we're going to discuss the topic of slavery. Before we do, I want everybody to take the time to go and check out the book, Slavery as Moral, as Moral Problem in the Early Church and Today. This is the book uh, we'll be discussing, but it really overlaps uh, Dr. Jennifer A. Glancy's work, Slavery and Early Christianity, her publication in 2002, and of course, uh, Slavery and Early Christianity, her publication in 2006. I suspect that's an updated version, but let's introduce our guest here. Dr. Gl Glancy, welcome to Myth Vision. Well, welcome, Derek. Thank you for having me. It's, just, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I really appreciate you doing this, taking the time to educate us. Um, you have dug very deep into this subject and really have a sensitivity in seeing things that, like I said, in my upbringing, I just read it a hundred times and just, you know, la, la, and never noticed. Um, mm -hmm. There's, there's a story within the story that we just don't know about. And I want to know the, the good, the bad, the ugly for many reasons. It, helps us not to repeat it so we can learn from the lesson, but it also makes me empathize with our ancestors and our families that we went through and how we may not need to continue perpetrating this kind of system on ourselves. And maybe we can find ways to avoid it. Uh, let's not try to paint it something it's not, but also we shouldn't go too far, right? And act like these, everybody's just evil and hate. I mean, they were living in a time, in a world, in the way they were. Uh, so we're going to touch all of that. Before you do, I think it's only polite for me to roll out the red carpet. Dr. Jennifer A. This is red carpet season, right? You know, Oscars, and now I get my own red carpet moment. <laughs> Let me go get my red carpet. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Jennifer A. Glancy is a scholar of New Testament and early Christianity. And the Reverend Kevin G. O'Connell's SG, SJ Distinguished Teaching Professor in the Humanities at Le Moyne College in Syracuse, New York. Her expertise lies in the cultural history of early Christianity, with a special emphasis on corporeality and Christian anthropology. 
Women's History and Antiquity, Gender Theory, and Comparative Studies of Slavery. Her book, Slavery and Early Christianity, 2002, was chosen as a history book club selection. If I went on and on, I would never have an episode. So there's so many things to investigate. Dr. Glancy, the first question I think is simple. What is slavery? So I think when we say uh, slavery, um, there, there are fancy academic um, definitions, but I think basically when most Americans talk about slavery, they're talking about the buying and selling of human beings um, as chattel, as, as what we call chattel, as property. Um, and so I would just like, in terms of um, the opening, sort of your sensational opening and the idea of uh, slavery in the ancient world was nothing like it is today. Um, I think it's really important to realize that the, the reference to the limited debt bondage is a reference to the world of um, Exodus, the world of Leviticus, the world of Deuteronomy. And it, those laws were not in place at the time of Jesus because he was living in the Roman Empire, not in the ancient Near Eastern world. Um, and so even there, I would, and again, I, in terms of debt bondage, I think precisely what people did lose was self-respect. You know, I mean, that, I mean, that was sort of why people tried to avoid it. Um, uh, th that's number one. Number two is um, it, it, there was, even, even though um, Israelites, according to the covenant code, the holiness code of the, the, the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, didn't enslave other Israelites, they did enslave non-Israelites, and they were enslaved by non-Israelites. So the restriction on slavery is really only on um, Israelite, to the extent that it was enforced, it really is only on um, Israelites owning other Israelites. And then finally, the other thing I would say is I would not want to downplay the, the horrors of debt bondage. And I think a lot of people who are campaigning against um, slaving in the, today's world, for example, interna International Justice um, Mission, um, IJM, which is great work um, and sort of against slavery systems around the world. A lot of that is against debt bondage. And so we know this, we know this is a horror in the modern world. It, it was horrible in the ancient world too, but it doesn't apply to the time of Jesus. So I'll, I'll stop there and you can ask me what next. <laughs> There's so many things to, to, to discuss. I actually knew when I, when I created that little intro that he wasn't <laughs> talking about the Roman period, but I threw up Roman images. I threw up you know, purposefully, because I knew we were going to go to this area. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the closest thing I could find in the short amount of time uh, coming from mm -hmm. a apologist who wants to try and paint a world from the biblical perspective that is trying to make it nice, uh, morally fied and, and sounding good. You, you've mentioned in lectures and in your works that there are slaves that literally are equated with, with cattle um, or some type of livestock. And how 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 is this not degrading to see you know as a human I'm I'm worth that of a of a bull or a you know or a, or some other animal in our minds whereas you know you know that the other humans are worth far more right and and so I mean um, right even in, if you go back to the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible you'll have lists of property oh Abraham has so many. Camp, you know, not camels, but donkeys and male and female donkeys and male and female slaves. And you're like, wait a minute, it's just like being listed with with the property. And um, yeah, so how do how do you weigh that against um, what a, a human being is is worth? And how do I guess I'd say how does it affect someone to hear themselves described in those terms? How does it at the point of sale, because, and certainly certainly in the Roman world and the world that Jesus grew up in, um, enslaved people were bought and sold. And how did that affect someone to be auctioned off? Um, you know, And I think that you have, um, even in New Testament texts that don't necessarily condemn um, slaving per se, you do have con condemnations of the slave trade. Um, I'm terrible at chapter and verse, but it comes up in the book of Revelation where sort of and humans, you know, human souls are part of the cargo. And that's clearly being like condemned that you would be trading in human beings. So there's a kind of kind of horror that's elicited in the idea that con confronting what it is to be sold. Hmm. But that is that that's sort of the limit case of, of the kind of chattel slavery um, that we had in the Americas, but that we also had in the Roman world. 
So you just answered kind of without giving us the details. Um, my next question, because I want to pave a road for people mm -hmm. to walk on. And that is uh, most people who are defending the Bible. Uh, and I'm saying apologist. Mm -hmm. I want the historical facts. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not interested in like trying to paint illusions to trick people to thinking everything's just kosher here. Mm -hmm. Your book literally titled this issue. And that is the slavery in the South, in America, really, it wasn't just the South. I mean, in America, that mm -hmm. was done on black people. Horror. I mean, like, there's no, we don't try to justify this today. I mean, literally, the people who try mm -hmm. to are racist. I mean, we clearly call them what they are. Um, <laughs> But it's ugly. And so a lot of people want to say, well, that is radically, as you heard William Lynn Craig, different from that of ancient Israel, or let's even go to the New Testament under Jesus's time. It is so different. It has like no comparison. Whereas I know that you've discussed there are differences, and I'd love to have you highlight a few of those differences. There are plenty of differences. I guarantee it, especially with the race thing. However, Right. The practice and the cruelty and, and the viciousness of the system, you know, can you can you tell us the differences and similarities to what was going on here versus what we see in Roman practice in the, in the antiquity? Sorry. Yeah, but I, I guess I would also say that um, maybe one place to start is that someone who is very much attached to the Christian tradition that I grew up in, um, someone who is white, someone who is American, someone who's a northerner, you know, you can probably hear it in my voice, but um, yeah. grew up in New Jersey. Um, and, um, and, and so I, I do think that we need to re realize that this was not just um, something that southerners did, that it, that the slavery, as I'm sure your listeners know, we had it in New York State, or New York, the colony, and then as into the Republican period into state. Massachusetts, New Jersey. I went to Columbia University uh, for my PhD, and that they made a lot of money off the slave trade, as as many northern universities enormously, you know. And so, part of my own sort of working on this as a moral issue is to say, "Oh my God, I've gotten privileges. I, I, you know, I use this amazing library at Columbia. How did the slave trade?" Fund that, like how did so so sort of looking looking at those questions, and 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 then also I would say in the American context, remembering that there were there were differences um, in the practices of slaving. It did make a difference if you were on a huge cotton plantation, or if you were in a workshop in um, you know in somewhere in the Chesapeake region, or if you were living in Philadelphia or New York. These things would all obviously affect the way you organized your day to day life, right? Um, but I think the limit case, again, we could talk then about being bought and bought and sold, um, that, that you come up across certain limit cases. So the big, I'd say the biggest and the most obvious difference between slavery in the Roman world and slavery in the Americas, as we, we tend to think about it, and, you know, you could find some exception somewhere, is that in the Americas, slavery was very quickly became race-based. And so it was something that was... Um, Visual people felt that they could visually tell someone who was either enslaved or had a uh, heritage of being a slave. And so that was a really huge difference. I think Israelites didn't um, enslave, permanently enslave other Israelites. Romans didn't permanently enslave other Romans. Greeks didn't permanently enslave other Greeks. And yet if you were living in Rome, there was no one kind of person who you would look at and think that you automatically knew if they were enslaved or not. Because people came from the British, you know, the British Isles, or they came from Sub-Saharan Africa, or they came from the far, you know, from further east in the Mediterranean. So, so, so the idea of race-based slavery, um, I think, is something really distinctive about the American experience and, and problematic about the American experience. Um, in the Roman Empire, there was a higher rate of manumission of freeing slaves than there was in the Americas. And that can't be, most of the people, by the first century, probably most people who were enslaved were born into that condition, lived their entire life in that condition, and died in that condition. But still, there was a higher hope or expectation of, of freedom than, than most enslaved people enslaved in the Americas. And for depending in the Roman Empire, if you were in very limited kind of way of being freed, this was probably not the 
not the most common, but there was way, one way of freeing slaves that they became citizens automatically. So another difference in the American experience is that when um, enslaved people were freed, Black people were often denied a lot of the rights of citizenship. Um, even if they were considered citizens, they they weren't treated equally as other citizens. So, so, so those are some really those are some important differences. Um, I think that that have to be acknowledged. I think that's that. There's so many more too, right? That you can list and go into. Um, but but there's a lot also. I guess morally speaking, some really bad stuff. I mean they're your property and especially female or male, you can use them however you want. Yeah. Um, this was something you, you, like, can you imagine someone trying to make an argument that, Oh, it's just ancient uh, employment. Um, <laughs> but I can use you, you know, yeah. uh, for whatever. Um, how would that work at your current employer? Uh, like, sexual harassment laws and things like that <laughs> like sexual harassment is like this that's like a polite way of putting it right so right um, um so there was um a greek saying that the slaves were answerable with their bodies and one of the things that meant was that if an enslaved person gave testimony it like in a court trial it was not just torture like you tortured testimony but that that was obviously less common one is that the the vulnerability to physical violence was pretty extreme so um constant people inside people always constant to just sort of like uh, i would say a constant low level of violence in their life a constant just sort of get, getting knocked around um because oh you know just for whatever reason, it, it to, up to extreme levels of violence. Rome was a very, very violent society, and uh, there was extreme. I mean, it was it was a spectacle. People would watch, you know, would watch, would watch and see people getting extreme punishments. Wow. Um, and well, that, I mean, that goes to, up to the arena, right? So a lot of the people who fought in the arena would would have been enslaved, um, gladiators among others. You know, that's why I added the call the little coliseum. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, so so that's kind of like, in some ways, you know, if they did well, they could achieve some prominence, but there was a lot of brutality on the way. But of course, the, the, the sexual use of slaves, um, which was very common in the Americas, and it was very, very common throughout the ancient world, and it was very, very common. Um, I mean, I don't, like, anyone who knows Genesis is going to say, oh, you know, the slavery, what's the real harm? Well, you have enslaved women who are being taken as secondary wives without any choices. You have you have Hagar, you have Bilha, you have Zilpah. Um, and my my um, and how did this affect family structures? I mean, this is going back to the time of ancient Israel, but certainly in the first century, that knowing that enslaved people were sexually vulnerable, um, when I started doing my research, a lot of scholars would say, "Oh, well, you know, physical slavery—that's kind of bad, but it's not really as bad as spiritual slavery." And I was always like. Really? I mean, I mean wow. like, I like if you're, but I, I also think these are people who haven't really thought through what it would be to be sexually vulnerable and have zero protection. Like there's no, like there's zero protection because you're someone's property. Um, and I also think the thing, other thing I would always say is, okay, maybe being beaten, you can remain spiritually free. If you start beating a little kid when they're two and you raise them under that, then if you have a child that's grown up constantly subject to abuse um, by slaveholders, by, by people outside the household, because enslaved people had very little protection against violence on the streets. Um, you know, so, so yeah, no, I, I yeah, there's, there's, that was a, a terrible part of the system, plus the possibility of being separated um, from from families, and and so we think about well, what were the attitudes like? You know, like slavery, it wasn't that bad. Okay, there's a first century Roman historian named Josephus, and he tells this story. It's a very famous story of Masada, where the Jewish people are having one of their final stands against Rome in the big war, and. Um, the men, according to the story, and I, I, you know, I'm not saying the story is historically true. Um, the men killed their wives and children to keep them from being sold, right? And then they killed themselves. Whether or not that story is true, that 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 suggests an attitude like slavery is an utter horror, and death might be preferable to right. the slavery. And so, to to look at something like this was a fear, a Jewish fear of slavery around 
70, which would have been held by everyone in the Roman world, you know, like that, like freeborn people did not want to be enslaved and then go like, oh, it's really no big deal. You know, tell, tell that to the guys at Masada. Um, and so even in a case where like that, then people are going to be sold all over the empire. And so there's that same loss of, it's not the middle passage that you have between Africa um, and the Americas. So you don't have the same oce oceanic graveyard, but you do have a tremendous loss of, of, um, of life um, and, and just loss of connection, like loss of language, like you're sold. Here I am talking about my Northern accent, but imagine just being, or don't imagine, I mean, it's a terrible thing to imagine being sold so far that you're not hearing the sounds of home anymore. I mean, that, that that's painful. So Wow. Yeah. I, I think one of the biggest problems is people not empathizing and actually trying to listen to the voices of people who suffer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something we all should learn. And I think we all can do better at it. I want to, I want to take us back to really the moral issue with Christianity in its earliest forms and throughout history, which I'm sure you'll start to kind of paint a picture for us. But you mentioned that the Essenes, we have a Jewish group. Uh, they're very, uh, what, what is the proper term for them? Um, uh, the Sadek, they Yes. Yeah. Yes. But they're, they're like a lot of the literature they have is apocalyptic. They, they, they expect the world to change. Mm -hmm. Maybe God's going to come in and, and do something, depending mm -hmm. on the literature you read, because it's not all one like message. Just like I would say the New Testament right. is, is multiple books from different people and different mm -hmm. perspectives, uh, sometimes even contradictory to one another in terms of an issue. Mm -hmm. The Essenes, you said that Josephus and Philo mentioned that they thought that slavery was like a crime against humanity in a way. Now, the Damascus document you point out and like in their literature themselves, they weren't unanimous on this. It was mm -hmm. almost like maybe certain individuals amongst them said, this is wrong and I will not practice it. However, when we get to the new Testament, when we get to the gospels, when we get to Paul, we don't see that. Yeah. So I think that's right. So you have the, this, um, first century group that we we know as the Essenes, and in their own writings, it seems as though, if I if I had to make a guess, I guess I, I might say something like they didn't have individual ownership of slaves, but maybe the community owned slaves. But it's it's murky. But what interests what really really interests me is that Philo, who's this uh, first century philosopher, Jewish philosopher um, from Alexandria in Egypt, Josephus the historian. Both report that this group called the Essenes um, does not, that they don't own slaves. And Philo says, right, because they don't own slaves because it's a violation of our common humanity. And so I just think it's it's really, to me, it's really interesting that there's this group of first century Jews who are apocalyptic, like people who followed Christ, right? Um, and they, they, they believe in the resurrection. They believe in a lot of things that Jesus followers are going to believe in. But they seem to, they had the reputation for imagining a world without slavery. Um, and yet when when you come along, um, Jesus, when Jesus says to Zacchaeus, when Zacchaeus, according to Luke, I don't know if there's a historical Zacchaeus, but you know, you got this guy, the, the way the story is told is, you know, Zacchaeus says, oh, I'm gonna sell, sell half my property and give it to the poor. Jesus doesn't say, well, first free the slaves, right? You know, does his property, he's a rich guy. Does his property include enslaved people? Or is he freeing them or is he selling them? Like it, it, it and we, we don't know. That's not specified. When Paul comes along, he doesn't say slaveholders can't be baptized. You know, slaveholders were baptized. And um, so you couldn't end slavery in the Roman Empire, but um, there was, there was no attempt to stop people who were slaveholders from restricting their membership in these communities. And I think that's really, a, I think that's hard. I think that we need to think about, um, well, for, when I say we, I'm talking about people, I'm, I'm thinking about myself as a historian, but I'm also thinking about those of us who are attached in one way or another to these documents and want to live by them, but also can't live by them because there are parts of them that I can't accept and and I can't I can't I, I can't live by that. Um, yeah, I have I have some good... that, maybe how we deal with scripture. I have maybe have some more things to say about that later. But sorry to yeah no no no. Uh, I, sorry I interrupted you. I, 
I um I have friends who are believers. Um and they they don't consider themselves apologists. Uh they mm -hmm. they're like there's some great stuff uh, that you mm -hmm. can find, some some good lessons. Um and so they cherry pick and mm -hmm. I'm like good for you. <laughs> like and one one buddy of mine who is an open theist. Uh, mm -hmm. I said, well, well, how do you feel about some of your stuff that doesn't fit open theism in the Bible? He goes, well, I, I, I just <laughs> have to wrestle with it. And he goes, um, and you know what? He said, the greatest cherry picker in the world to me was Jesus. And so I'm going to be like <laughs> Jesus. And I was like, all right, cool. I like that. You know, he's willing to negotiate uh, with the material rather than be inerrant, infallible, or in some manner act like this is the instruction we should absolutely live by so much so I would say deceptive tactics or lying, outright lying is taking place to defend the Bible. They're actually creating more, I would say, more of a problem for people who are investigating the truth, who are discovering your work and other academics that I have on this channel. Um, they're doing more damage by doing that because they're going to see through the lie. And now they're being forced to, 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 to exit or feeling compelled to not be able to negotiate with the material any longer in a way that is satisfactory. So that was my little vent. There's, a, I, I wanted to get into other things, but I want to take a few super chats. Okay. I don't know if you've ever been on a stream before. No, it's a big throw. So people can super chat. It helps support the channel, but they can like ask questions or make comments and things like that. And it comes up as like a colorful message at the bottom. The first one we got is uh, Jeff Cochran. Uh, forgive me if I butchered it. Derek, thank you for your curiosity. It's inspiring. Well, thank you. And then the next one is Dr. Joshua Bowen. I was telling you about him before we started. And that is Digital Hammurabi. So excited to see Dr. Glancy on the stream. Thoughts on the New Testament showing moral progression on slavery to condemn, ultimately condemn it, apologetic? Yeah, that's, I, I you know, that's so, that's so, um, um, uh, when I first started, uh, maybe working on this material, I remember writing one of an early article that was called slaves and slavery in the Mythian parables. And my husband got to the end of it and he was like, I wanted to have a different ending. And I said, I do too. <laughs> I want to, I want to conclude something other than what I'm concluding here that I, you know, I, as I think ultimately Christianity has to be compatible with honesty and we have to be honest about this. Um, I don't, I think that uh, there are passages in the new Testament um, that can be, that are used um, in abolitionist movements that can and rightly should be used in abolis, abolitionist movements. But I don't think that early Christians themselves are necessarily on that trajectory. And I think that you can really tell, I guess the way to, to really respond to this, I'm, I'm rambling a bit as I are to think it to myself, you can tell this either is a story of, oh, you know, at the beginning, Christians didn't see the real horror, but as the Christian movement goes on, they see the real truth. But you can also tell it as a story of Jesus starting off, um, not condemning slavery, but saying to his followers, everyone needs to be slaves to one another. And in a world without masters, we could say there would be no slaves, right? You know, so there's a kind of rejection of hierarchy there. And then as we get into the writings that I, I consider deuterocanonical, I don't consider them by Paul, um, writings like a Colossians and First Timothy and Titus that are really stri strictly saying to enslaved people, obey your masters, like, right. you know, listen to your masters. And so it's the story there is being told not of moral progression, but of greater and greater conformity to Roman values. I don't want to posit a pure golden moment where the the message of the Jesus followers was all egalitarian. I think that's, I wish that were the case. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think that's a bit um, romanticized. Um, but I, I do think that we do see unevenly in, increasing um, conformity to Roman values as you go into the late first century and into the early second century. And I was I, I'm curious for everybody, I don't know if he wants to respond. Oh, um, um, they just they just write the comment and they can super chat again if they want to say anything. But uh, uh, Dr. Josh, appreciate that. And then I have Pat Lowinger, who's also another uh, scholar. I'm a big fan of Dr. Glancy, too. Great scholarship. Thanks. 
So what what interests me, and in, in, as someone who once believed it was an errant, infallible, perfect, like God's word and all that, um, is that it took us, you know, 1,700, 1,800 years under what we would call Christian, the Christian church, which is supposed to be mm-hmm. moved by the Holy Spirit. No wonder you get like Mormons who say, oh, there was a great a falling away at the very beginning of the church. And like these various sects of, of uh, what we would say are, if you're Orthodox, you'd say these are heretical movements that kind of come out. But like they they have certain certain ideas. And usually it's not about slavery as to why they say there was a great falling away. They, they're saying other reasons so that their church is the one that's the true one. But like if you take this literally, that the spirit, the pneuma, as Paul calls it, as like I would say is middle Platonist and and has some stoicism here. So this is a physical mm-hmm. essence that he thinks mm-hmm. is active in the community. First of all, First Corinthians would make very little sense to me that he's constantly saying like, what are you guys doing? Uh, the spirit's supposed to be changing the way you act. Uh, but like throughout, throughout the entire church history, we see this really big thing that if like God had solved this future situation, the way I'm, you can see how I'm thinking here. Yeah. Why did it take us 1800 years or so? I'm throwing out a number Mm -hmm. to get to this stance and like really stamp it down. I'm not saying there weren't voices along the way. I'm saying, why didn't, why didn't that change happen? Totally hypothetical, but you know, so uh, one book that I would really recommend to your readers um, is um, by, uh, it's called, and it's about the Catholic Church. And I wrote it, I wrote down the names of some things I might want to read the titles of All Oppression Shall Cease, Slavery, Abolition, and the Catholic Church. And it's a really recent book within the past year um, by Christopher Kellerman. And he is a young Jesuit. And it's really about the history of the really, 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 really shamefully long time that took the Roman Catholic Church to condemn slavery and the long, long, long history of support for slaving practices in the Catholic Church. And I think it's a really brave book. I think it's braver than anything that I've written because I think that Christopher is a Jesuit and I think that, well, I know he's a Jesuit. And you're writing, you know, you're writing something that's really, really challenging about um, something that's a clear moral wrong that the church was not on the right side of. Um, so I, 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 I really admire that kind of that kind of work. Um, I, I think that it's just I think that just when you're a child, you learn to speak the language that you're taught. And I think the the church grew up speaking the language of the time and the church churches, synagogues, mosques conform to the values of their larger of the larger society, um, and there was self interest in in doing so. So it's a it's a painful, um, it's a painful thing. I and I think something about a, a bunch of things that I would say that we now take for granted. Like when I was growing up, when I was young, I'm 62, so you know, in 66 or something, you might see a parent thwack a kid in public, and no one would say anything. Like, you know, it was just kids got hit, right? And now we would have social, uh, in those places, I think we'd have sort of social strictures against that. That would be problematic. But what we would now consider unacceptable levels of violence towards children were, were really common, right? Sp- spoil, spare the rod and spoil the child. And I know that some of that thinking still goes on. And I think that's really problematic thinking because um, I think violence te- violence is pedagogical. It teaches violence. Mm. Um, and And so, but something like that we thought, um, issues really caring about someone, um, the issue of consent, I think, is fairly recent. I mean, there's a long history, if you think about um, sexual violence against women or men or against anyone, boys. Um, it, the question of whether or not they consented wasn't always relevant historically to the question of whether or not they were shamed. <laughs> you know, so sort of it's it's beyond blame the victim. It's, it's if if someone's been sexually violated against their will that somehow they're they're dirty and these these attitudes were really hard to to change they're really 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 passed down through generations and there's a lot of self-interest in maintaining that system so i think i think the question of moral change the way you're posing it um and it is something i try to take on in slavery is moral problem how does that change like and maybe this this hits home to you in some way if you're inside of a system Mm 
then to be good and moral is to uphold the values of that system. And coming to see that the system itself is wrong, tainted, dehumanizing, actually makes you engage in behavior that the system is going to see as bad. Mm. Right? So you're um, you're going to have to come to a point, point where you say, um, no, I, I can't behave like that anymore. I can't do that. Then you're the one who is seen to be wrong rather in the view of the system. Does, am I saying that clearly? Yeah. In another way of putting it is they're ahead of their time because yeah. they're not, they're not situated in their current context. They're trying to break the system because the system is, is got serious issues and flaws. I've said the same thing about um, prison, the Ooh. way we do this. Oh man. I mean, this is like another form of slavery. Yes. Um, and there's just so many problems. And I looked at it from a psychological, cause I, mm -hmm. I come from a mental health mm -hmm. area, no expertise in it, but I am a recovering drug addict. And I had to do mm -hmm. a lot of research mm -hmm. as I was getting clean and helping other drug addicts mm -hmm. to get out of the vicious cycle of addiction. And, um, there's this, there's this notion of like, how do we rehabilitate and should people just go to jail and lock people up or go to prison for multiple years? How do you get a drug addict to to get out of the cycle? Inspired me to look into this more, and I'm like, we now we know this. We've known this for half a century at least, if not longer. That uh, isolation um, and putting people in these boxes and thinking this is supposed to rehabilitate. I'm not saying there isn't a small percentage that come out in some way changed, but for the most part you're actually making them more uh, criminal, like if they had any criminal in inclinations before. And like there's, it's not helping them rehabilitate. And other, I would say, secular societies that have found models of getting them to go to work and uh, working systems to get them not to go to prison or jail are actually more progressive. And we see the results are better. So there's just, I, I, like, what do we do, right? What do we do with this this idea? And And moving forward, I just... There are Christians who have this really strict God is actually active in like in everyday life and is very active in the things that we do. And they think that uh, he kind of steers history and you go, well, how come for 1800 years back to that question, mm -hmm. we humans have been doing that. Oh, that's humans. Don't put that responsibility on God. But <laughs> you, you, you say he's in control. You like you say his spirit is guiding his church. You say there's a lot of things they say. And to me, right. to me, it sounds like these are humans doing human things. Not, not that, uh, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's complicated. Uh, yeah. But I also think the connection between, um, slavery and, um, the American prison system is, is, is so horrific really. And it's forms of unfreedom. Um, and it's, it, there, there's such a, there's so many really ugly continuities there yeah. that that's a whole, Oh, I, you know, I hope that you have have time to, to really think about that in other episodes too. Cause I, I, I think it's really, really critical, but even think about some of the ways that we people, I'm not saying you or I or anyone on this chat, although maybe one or another of us have at some time fallen into it, that the way we joke about Americans joke about sexual violence in prisons, it's horrible. Like it's, it, 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 it's a horrible thing. And but people act like, well, yeah, well, you know, what do you, you know, what do you expect? You know, like, I don't know, like <laughs> you sold them drugs. So now you just are what? Like it, it, right. it's, it's this horrific thing. And I think that level. So when people look at slavery and they're like, how could anyone have ever thought that was okay? Well, how can we as Americans act as though this is okay when it's going on right now? And it's, wow. and it's not okay. And it's, it's the same thing about violence as pedagogy and what that, you know, what that, um, what that does. So I, yeah, hard wow. question. And as you say that there were voices from antiquity, Christian voices from antiquity that are important to hear. And I both want them to be heard and to say, and they, they were not the major voices. Right. And there's this, I talk about Gregory of Nyssa and he's a fourth century theologian and he's beautiful. He says, how can you buy and sell you know, someone who's the image of God, like how much would you pay for that? Like you can't, you can't like humans are of infinite worth. That's really beautiful. But he wasn't, a, he might not have been consistent on that in his own life, but more like more importantly, his wasn't the major voice in the church that was heard. Um, yeah. So hmm. those are hard questions. Wow. 
Powerful, powerful. Um, See, I, guess, I guess I, I, I'm not sure. Sort of, do we have a time frame here? No, I am yours, so okay. don't worry. I'm all your time. I'm I'm having fun. I do also want to say that I think it's um, some of your listeners might be interested in there are a number of my colleagues who are biblical scholars um, who who are um, who are black and who write from a, a, the perspective of the black church and they have dealt with issues of slavery in the Bible in some really different ways. Um, and so I'm thinking about my colleague Emerson Powery, for example, who wrote with Rodney Sadler a book called The Genesis of Liberation. And really what that is showing is how enslaved people in the American South, um, when they wrote their narratives, how they use the Bible. So like I'm emphasizing in some ways the bad way, the bad news. I'm emphasizing um, how have Christian traditions from the outset been really distorted by slaveholding values. That I think is something, and if we're gonna change, as, as you've been saying, we need to, to acknowledge that and say, where do we as Americans or believers or non-believers or whatever, but where do we go from here? Like, how do we how do we emerge from these really distorted ways of thinking? And yet other people, um, uh, Lisa Bowens has a great, great book called African-American Readings of Paul. And that's really good because she shows how African-Americans from like the, the 1700s to the 20th century, many of them found courage and hope in the writings of Paul. Some of them really you know, didn't. And so that she shows a range of African-American readings of Paul. So I think it's important to realize that the, these scriptures, um, as you say, reflect lots of different people's perspectives. They don't, I mean, I would never assume that they all have one unified message. Right. You know, they're written by different people at different times and they, they say different things. Um, but the, also that they have meant different things to different readers and different communities and people who have needed strength have looked to these um, volumes and have found sources of strength that um, I think that that's also important to remember that as well. So I'm going to get back to in a minute, the, the historical new Testament material mm -hmm. with you, but before we do, you, you're touching something that is so valuable and it's very important. People watching kind of try to digest this. If you were a slave in America you have zero control over your circumstances. You're stripped of the right of being able to do anything about this. And you came across this literature. You were taught about Jesus uh, because you're raised in a household that may be Christian. And you're reading Paul or somehow you're coming across Paul's letters. In your circumstance, hearing there's neither free nor slave, there's neither this, you get value from that. There's some value in this. So, so I... I I try to empathize, put myself in their shoes and understand how this might have been refreshing mm -hmm. from that, that circumstance. And mm -hmm. it's very perception based on how mm -hmm. we're going to read and understand this. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, I guess it's kind of the like wish that we didn't have this to begin with, or someone abolished this long ago. Right. So mm -hmm. we have to deal with the realities. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a couple super chats here and then, I, but I wanted to get back to, to text. Which one do you want to do? You want to wait on super chats or do you want to get super chats and then go back to, you know how this works better than I do. I really, it, it's really no different other than let's, when let's do some super chats, super chats. All right. We'll have some fun with super chats then. Alan bird Constantine replaced face tattoos on slaves with collars. The collars have Christian emblems showing that Christianity actively supported slavery. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's absolutely true. And um, and so some scholars would argue, and I'm not arguing this, but you said that, that the slave collars were actually there for, um, you know, it was back like, would you rather be wearing one of these slave collars or would you rather have a tattoo on your face? And these would be for for people who typically an enslaved person would try to liberate themselves, would you know, run away. Um, who committed the crime of of owning themselves? I'm joking; it's not a crime. Um, and and so uh, the slave collars might say, "Oh, you know, hold me, so I do not flee," or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and and so is this tamping it down? I mean, this is this is where the reader has to decide. I mean, exactly right. Like, is this making it sort of nicer because we're no the, no enslaved people are no longer being tattooed on the forehead? Or is this uh, is this actually a sign, absolute sign of the ongoing uh, Christian commitment uh, 
and you know, making it really clear that people were enslaved by um, uh, deacons or wh whoever, members of the church. So I, I, that's a really good point to Alan Bird, absolutely. I inserted that in our intro for those, mm -hmm. most people are just mm -hmm. now showing up or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they haven't seen the intro, but that caller, it literally is Latin and it says, hold me lest I flee and return to my master. Oh, return me to my master Viventius on the estate of Callistus or mm -hmm. Callistus. Um, so. Yep. And a lot of, a lot of those callers then have, um, and someone just said precisely, you know, they might have a Christian symbol like a key row or something like which are two Greek letters. Um, so so they were clearly associated w with Christianity and, and monasteries and enslaved people. And uh, it, yeah. Uh, Pat Lowinger says precisely why Gregory of Nyssa was a rare voice. A rare voice. He really and he was. Wow. Uh, Dr. Cheryl, thank you for being a member and always being in the chat. Cheryl's a huge fan. Welcome, Dr. Glancy. Why do you think slavery was not included in the Ten Commandments? Well, it depends what you mean included in the Ten Commandments, because it, in fact, actually, you're not supposed to cover your, you know, it is mentioned in the sense of um, you're not supposed to covet your neighbor's slave. So, I mean, so, so there, there's mentions to, I, 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 it was part of the legal, I mean, it was just part of the law. I mean, it was just, there's, there's slave. I'm not, I guess I'm, mm, um, I think it was, I don't know. What does Dr. Cheryl think? I think that, um, I think that um, slavery was something that the, was legally upheld um, at the time that the, those codes were written. Um, it, it yeah, it's part of the, the legal system that's supported. It's hard to even see outside mm -hmm. of it if you were in it, right? Like we probably hold things today. I, I said this many times on my show before. I'll say it again. Um, I hope if our children are watching, we're probably wrong on so many things. And I hope you do better than us. But I also hope you know that like we're trying. And that's mm -hmm. really what we're trying to do because we don't, and we're also forced by a system. We're, 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 we're stuck in a system having to live with certain things. So we're hoping that you do better than we do. And that's my words to our, to our uh, predecessors here. Dr. Cheryl says, given the ties between slavery and Christianity, what do you think is vital to eradicating the longstanding effects of race-based slavery still present in our society? Well, that's, um, I think that is really important. Important. And so one of the th things that I would say is I think it's really important to look at the way from the outset that um, slavery th from the to see at the outset the way that the slavery shaped Christian thinking. Um, I think on I think that for um, for churches, I think there's a lot of work for predominantly white churches still to do in terms of contending with the legacy of slaveholding. And I think that's really, really hard to do because so often, well, as, as a Christian congregations, we want to think, oh, we do this, we take care of other people, we serve other people. And seeing how we have benefited from unjust structures, that's a really painful thing. That's also at the heart of what Christians are supposed to do in terms, I think, of in terms of repentance, mm -hmm. shuv, to turn, to turn, to turn the other way. I think that that is really at the heart of that work. Um, I also think it's really important, and I'm now speaking as a white American, white Christian, um, to to learn to listen to um, uh, voices of our black fellow Christians and black people who are black who are not Christians, as black and uh, other minoritized members of society, but in the U.S., really black people who have who were um, affected by the legacy of slaveholding. Um, who may have totally different issues than than I do, you know, who, because um, I've dealt with when I've I've spoken before predominantly black audiences, their perspective, how they're coming at something, I may be like, I never would have seen it that way. And I need to think about the way I'm framing something. Again, I, the one thing I would say is my tendency to focus on the bad news and to say we need to focus on this, um, to focus on the distorting effects of slavery on these ideology and practices and 
but also hearing voices saying, well, you know, the spirit comes to everyone the same. And I'm like, okay, then I also need to honor these voices as well. So those are some of the things that we need to do. And then um, figuring out ways to work for <laughs> against the prison complex and ways to work for, in, um, you know, economic justice, I guess I would say. That's a lot, Dr. Cheryl. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> what do you think? Where would you start? I mean, I guess for me, one of the things that, one of the reasons I, I've written about this is, at a certain point, and I was there, I, I had different starting points for writing about this, but one of them was I was getting questions from students. And, you know, I'm like the teacher, I'm like, well, go look it up in the library, right? And they'd come back and be like, well, we're not finding anything. I'd be like, oh, let me show you. And then I went and I was like, oh, there's really nothing good that I can recommend here. Um, so that was one reason that I, I, um, I started to to write about this and started to work on it. And then at a certain point I realized, well, as a white person, what should I be saying? And I thought, well, I can either be silent or I can speak. And now that I've done this work, I know some things and I need to, to share what I know and then other people can do with that what they wanna do with it. But um, it's, for me, it's a choice between speaking and not speaking and not speaking is not the path I've chosen. There's something interesting about what you said that I feel like as a practice, I'm trying to point out to others. It's like, speak or don't, but if you're going to speak, like if what you're doing isn't helping the cause, you're literally speaking to silence it or try to apologetic. Oh, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Blacks, slavery with blacks in America, it wasn't as bad in some place. Like, what are you doing right. trying to like protect? So th this is something I see happening a lot. Um, it, it happens with hyper conservatives, in my opinion, that are trying to somehow like act like right. we don't have all of this stuff that really needs changing. But anyway, I don't want to get political. I just it, it, this is a, a social ethical issue. <laughs> it's much bigger than politics to me, even though it all has its webs connected. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I choose to speak when I speak. I'm going to call the ugly out because I hope we change. And yeah. so for me. I don't know any other way than to just educate people to give them the facts and then they can chew on it. And I think that I believe that most people will come out on the right side. I, I think mm -hmm. most people who know this information, who see the facts, who understand it and aren't purposefully doing manipulative tactics, apologetics or deceptive work to try and defend and protect something that is what it is, will find out like, OK, hold up. This makes sense now. Um, one more and then we'll get to Jesus because okay. that's really the hot topic, right? Like people want to okay. hear what Jesus or Paul, the early church is saying. Matthew Pop says, did Saturnalia and Rome's freeing of its slaves influence Judaism or Christianity in any way, especially the early Christian movement? Yeah. So, um, so Saturnalia is a, a, a festival where, um, you know, sort of masters and slaves change places once a year. I, I guess I would say a practice like that actually probably ultimately um, actually reinforces the system. I mean, it, it's like a moment of freedom, but it's it ultimately um, doesn't really disrupt the system at all. Um, I actually, I think that the, the Rome's freeing of its slaves, um, that there, that there was a possibility that enslaved people could be freed. It actually it affects theology. It affects some of the ways that um, uh, the being manu manumitted or freed becomes a, a central Christian way of thinking that Jesus bought your freedom. Um, we get this in the New Testament in different ways, that you are purchased out from sin, that you are purchased out from sort of the charge of, of sin against you. And so I think it, it affects it in various kinds of ways. There is a point at which there's a Christian practice that develops of manumission taking place in churches in a formal kind of way. It doesn't seem to have... Um, expanded or in it it doesn't seem to have increased the frequency of manumission i think what it did is and then in a system where church the church in in late antiquity has become a kind of public institution it creates an, a place where those kinds of where that can um uh, where, where that where that's happening because it's now a public institution so i'm not sure um yeah i wouldn't necessarily say it influenced in other 
other ways. Again, I, I in some other setting, I'd be like, I want to hear more about what behind the question or more about <laughs> what you think in my classroom. That's always what my students ask a question and then they roll their eyes because I'm like, that's interesting. You tell me. So. Well, thank you so much for answering that. Sorry, I was pulling up some scriptures because I think the best thing we can do is, is look at them and try to understand them. You do something... Again, you know how you said you're listening to blacks in America who are discussing this and you're like, whoa, I never saw that. Would have never thought of it this way. Mm -hmm. I do that when I read your your work and when I listen to you. And I think it's because coming from an alpha military home, uh, you know, uh, conservative mm -hmm. hardcore uh, family that, you know, I don't I don't have the sensitivities to noticing things that I've read my whole life as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And now I read them and I'm like, Ooh, I never thought to put myself in that kind of situation. So we have to, we have to discuss. I also think that once you start doing this work, then you start seeing it everywhere, you know? And so like, um, so here, let me give you an example of something that I bet a lot of your listeners will be like, huh. Ah. <laughs> so, um, Joseph, I'm actually doing some work now on the story of Joseph in Genesis. And he's, of course, sold into slavery by his brothers, which is horrible, yeah. terrible, you know, unbelievably bad. But then you go like, wait, some of his brothers were the sons of enslaved women, right? So he's sold into slavery, but it's you've already got slavery in this family in some problematic ways. Hmm, did that affect the relationships among the brothers? And if you go back to the beginning of the Joseph story, what you'll see is the first mention of tension between him and, between, um, him and his brothers is when he's out shepherding with the sons of Bilha and Zilpah, and he brings back bad reports about them. So you have a story in which he's actually shepherding with the sons of enslaved women, and he comes back, and he rats them out, and they still should not have sold them into slavery. But but when you start to think about this, this is already a family that has slaveholding in its background that is then influencing things. You, I think you start wow. seeing things like that that you hadn't really seen before, and you thought, well, well, wait, what was it like you know, growing right. up with this, this family? And I could go back and show you in places in Genesis, places where this distinction continues to be made, like throughout Genesis. Um, the, you know, sort of the enslaved women the, or the, the, the female slaves, whatever you want to say, and their sons go first in line or something like that. So those distinctions continue to be made. And in some ways, I also would take that as a metaphor for where we are as Americans or Christians or however we're identifying ourselves, that we, we come into families where this is already part of the pattern. And, right. and so it takes a while to recognize like, oh, this isn't just happening in a vacuum, but this is happening against this, this really difficult. All right, let, let's go to Jesus. Okay, let's get to Jesus, and then I'll get to your super chat there. Jay, appreciate you in the house. All right, uh, pulled up some examples. We'll start with, uh, why not start, start with one that I thought, you did a presentation on this, you discussed this in your work, that I was just like, okay, wow. Did Jesus condemn it? Well, let's 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 read something here in Luke 17. And um, I think this is an important passage. Luke 17, uh, 7 through 10 has a shocking parable. And that is, will any of you, this is Jesus and he's speaking to his disciples. So like it's, he's not talking like generically. I know that people can find ways to make this mean mm -hmm. something to them, but he's talking to his own. Will any of you who have a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, at the end of the day, imagine coming home from work, come at once and sit down at the table. Will he not, will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and gird yourself and serve me till I eat and drink and afterward you shall eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded, like you're supposed to do this. So you also, when you have done all that is commanded to you, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Wow. So, and so the word servant there um, would be the, the Greek word 
for slave. And, and, and so it's not just that, it's not even just that even that they were sugar coating it when this was first translated into English, but the what servant and slave, are, uh, those meanings shift somewhat over time. So there's a, in tradition, many uh, English uh, translations will say servant where any, if you were translating any other Greek text from this period, you would simply say slave, the word means slave. Right. Um, and so that really, the, the, for me, the incredibly awkward thing about that passage is that Jesus seems to be assuming that some of his listeners who are among the 12 might own, be slaveholders. And I think to us, that's startling. Like, how could that be? That's not possible. He must mean something else. And I guess I, one thing I would say is Luke's a super precise writer. Luke is a really, really good writer. Luke does not just use like random words. I mean, Luke is a very polished stylist. Uh, you go back to the beginning of the gospel of Luke and it's dedicated in this highfalutin way to one Theophilus. And, you know, so he, Luke, Luke is always a sort of beautiful, beautiful craftsman. And, and so he's saying, which of you who has a slave? That's very startling, I think, to us as 21st century um, readers. And we may find that implausible. And I don't know what I think. Do I think that any of the 12 could have been slaveholders? I, whatever, maybe it's my own piety. It's really hard for me to go that far. Um, right. But I will say that Luke's closer to the situation than I am. And Luke thinks it's like Luke just writes that. Like that's just that's just there. So see, I would approach it maybe the way I pr approach it is a is a bit different of like, is there like if if we knew one of them owned slaves it, it, at this point in my my life, I would it wouldn't it wouldn't affect me. Like I wouldn't feel defensive in any way. It's more a matter. And I think I've heard you say this before that you're a minimalist in the sense of historically, what is accurately the case uh, go to the Jesus seminar. Like what did Jesus really say? And what is the creation of the author? Right. And so whether or not uh, this is what Jesus really did, because getting behind that uh, curtain to see the wizard I, I don't know what we can trust and know with any reliability for sure. I, I'm very open-minded and at the same time agnostic about what is or isn't going back to the guy. But this is at least the perception of the author and what they think Jesus is saying. So at the very least, it sounds that that angle is showing exactly what we're describing here. I, I don't see any other way to get around this. And what really got me was the key words unworthy slaves we have only done what what was our duty and to me i don't know i mean to me to us today we would look and go ooh, like this is no good to them i don't think that they're thinking this way yeah. but you've mentioned also elsewhere where the word curious or going for the christ or the lord people and translated it as lord you just go no this means master and it placing it within this slave world in the first century master is better suited paul talks about being a slave to christ i think he means i'm not saying he thinks jesus really over here is his like slave master but in a real sense he believes that that he is somehow a slave to christ and and would you discuss that somewhat so yeah i absolutely think that that's the case and i think that this word um a curious, which we is we say Lord, but it is the word that you would also use to address a master. That that's just precisely the case. And so when Paul is saying that he's a slave of Christ, I think he's saying a, a couple things. One is I think he thinks that he's he's been purchased by Christ, and he would use that language. Um, and I also think he thinks he's controlled by Christ. I think that because he has the pneuma, he's received the pneuma of Christ. I think he's he's being controlled. So there's this. There's the slaveholder's fantasy of the enslaved person as being without a will. So um, uh, just the, the idea, the, the slaveholding fantasy is that this enslaved person can sort of as a thinking, acting extension of yourself, but who is only going to act on what you want and not what they want. And Paul speaks of his own relationship to, to Christ that way. So is you know, being possessed um, and really controlled by the, the by the pneuma, as you say. That yeah, I mean, I hear that pneuma pretty substantially. Um, by by the pneuma of Christ, that 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 he is enacting that. Um, I I think that's that's true. And um, and then what you do with that, I think, is going to vary vary by audience. I think that there are 
um, some people who would say that that's a mode of liberation. Um, that's not where I go with this, but there are people for whom that's true. There are communities who would talk about the experience that way. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's definitely just simply playing into that language. Yeah, you're so. I want to know the historical context like you and like literally try to figure out what it meant to them. And this, I, something came to mind while you were talking and it was purchased by Christ. Mm -hmm. We have like entire Protestant movements that have a, a particular uh, Christology in which they think that um, you need to know what kind of sacrifice Jesus has, but using your model of, of, slavery in early Christianity and understanding Paul within that world of slavery, mm -hmm. when he says he's purchased by Christ, you know, you can imagine like a cat, a uh, uh, Roman, not Roman, sorry, the um, Calvinist that have a like uh, justification, justified atonement where Jesus's blood literally in some way purchases mm -hmm. the person, the soul of the, of the human. Does your understanding of slavery in this idea of Jesus's death and his purchasing of Paul change how one might understand that in its first century context versus how Calvinist and those who have kind of a reformed, you get where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. That's, that's a hard question for me. What I can say is I can see from the perspective of later church history, I can see why going back, um, people would find that language there and what use they would make of it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that, I think that arrow leads only there. Right. And the, you could have that going out in, in, in different, con and you know, clearly it does in Christian history, the way it plays out. Um, but it, that's part of what I guess I would say is this isn't just about, um, you know, sort of power relations in American society or something like that, but this is about how these, this kind of, um, it, this kind of language has shaped our core ways of thinking. Right. And, and, and not that this is the only way it could play out, but once you start with these seeds, this is, this is where it goes. So I would say, and I'm going to probably have to go in about 10, 15 minutes. I'm not even going to keep you that much longer. I, okay. I wanted to get into a few more examples and then we'll just hit these uh, okay. super chats. Okay, I yeah. really appreciate your time, by no, the no, way. No. Yeah, no, yes. thanks. Um, you're awesome. <laughs> the oh next example is Luke 12. Uh, so we're dealing with Luke chapter 12, 42 through 48. And that says, and the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise steward whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant or slave whom his master, when he comes, when he comes, will find so doing. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that slave says to himself, my master is delayed in coming. I think this is dealing with a parousia. Uh, but if that servant says, okay, sorry. Then, and begins to beat the men servants and the maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant slave will come on a day when he does not expect him. And in an hour, he does not know and will punish him and will put him with the unfaithful and the servant who knew his master's will but did not make ready or act according to his will shall receive a severe beating uh, so like he's playing this author is literally playing and of course there are synoptic parallels to this this passage uh in matthew i don't know if there's a radical difference here but they're playing into this exact scheme of masters beating their slaves he doesn't condemn it he uses the model to kind of formulate his point of view to make sense of his point. Yeah. You know, and I think that there's um, so one thing that's really striking to me about that is the notion, okay, if you knew what you were doing and you still did the wrong thing, then you're going to get severe beating. But if you didn't know and you did wrong, when well, you're still going to get a light beating, it's just, it's, it's sort of what I was saying before about the acceptance that this is a world that accepts that, you know, sort of, well, you know, a little bit of violence or just to keep people in line, uh, which is what I would think of as an older but still persistent attitude towards children. Well, you know, you got to thwack them around a little bit, you know, otherwise, you know, um, and so there's kind of this, this, this 
acceptance of a certain level of violence as right. serving a, a pedagogical function, right? Like the slave, the enslaved, and, and so obviously the parable about, is about something else, but it's based on a cultural expectation that this is okay and even almost as though um, it's the moral thing to do. Like you, it's your job. Um, and this would go then really more into the household epistles of First Timothy, if it's your job to keep your household in order, well, you may not like it, but you're just going to have to, you know, beat a few people up every so often, wife, kids, slaves, you know, just sort of to, you know, keep them in line because you're in. So it's that kind of attitude that's that's behind this teaching. Yeah. And I was thinking even in that, like the master, who's the master in this? Is mm -hmm. is this Jesus who's saying when he comes back, because you're waiting on your master to return, mm -hmm. is this Jesus? Is this Yahweh? I'm not sure, but I imagine this is maybe Jesus by the mm -hmm. time Luke's writing. I'm with you in second century Luke. Um, I've heard you mention that. But but the idea is the master's going to come and he's going to give this person a severe beating. I wonder if this is the parousia or if this is 70 AD. Don't know where to make of it. Uh, there's so many different things, but... Th that was one that came to mind. The last example, and there's so many we could get into, um, but I want to be very kind of your time and I appreciate you so much. Let me zoom in so our audience can actually probably see. Okay, never mind. Let's just do this. And he entered Capernaum. A centurion came forward to him, beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed, or my slave is lying paralyzed at home in terrible distress. He said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered him, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my slave will be healed. For I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does He does it. When Jesus heard him, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and sit at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into our into the outer darkness, where men will gnash, weep and gnash their teeth. And the centurion said, go, be, uh, be it done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed, or the slave was healed at that very moment. So the interaction here with, uh, at least is portrayed by the author that Jesus is interacting with slave owners, uh, people who own people. And, and this interaction, we can learn a lot from this. Yeah. So again, when people say, um, oh, well, I have to say, I don't really think if Jesus was in Galilee, I don't think he would have encountered that many slaves. One thing to remember is that that first century um, uh, historian, Josephus, has a story from around, I don't know, 4 BCE, maybe a little after, um, in which uh, there's a Galilean town, Sepphoris, which rebels, and the entire population is sold into slavery. So I think it's really plausible that, again, not like any particular moment we can historically verify, but it's it's historically plausible that Jesus grew up hearing about people in his vicinity who are enslaved. And here you have a member of the military, maybe the Roman military in Galilee, or maybe part of the Her Herodian military official. And um, and that person would have been a slaveholder. And Jesus is seen interacting with that person. So when we think about details like that, we can begin to say, oh, this is a slaveholding world. It doesn't look like, you know, I don't know, Tara from Gone with the Wind, right? You know, it's a different configuration. It's Galilee in the first century. But there were these encounters. And then, of course, this thing of, it's you know, I'm so glad that Jesus has said to heal this enslaved person. And I Jesus had a reputation as a healer. I, I think that's certainly true that he had a reputation as a healer. And um, so great, but he's, is, so the, the really painful question about that story and its different forms is, is he doing it on behalf of the enslaved person or is he doing it for the centurion who becomes a model of faith? You know, or is he doing it for the centurion? Is he doing it in Luke's version? Is it really a favor to the leaders of the synagogue because the centurion's been a patron to the community? And 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 so you have this question of even who benefits from this action? Obviously, the enslaved person, and yet there's a wider network of benef benefit, I know, of benefaction as well. There's so many good things here you said, and and uh, we only have two super chats. And I just want to make a quick comment on that, and that is, I can imagine people in America who own slaves who see this centurion as a great example of a man of faith who owns property. 
who mm-hmm. owns people as property mm-hmm. and finding that totally fine. And you, you even see this with Joseph Smith. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got some scholars and historians who study Joseph Smith and the actions that he did where we would say polygamy. Uh, and it's not like where modern consent is an issue. This is like he's manipulating these girls saying God said and things like that. And he ends up in these situations. Well, people called him David, King David. Uh, and Jonathan was uh, William Clayton, I think it was. I can't remember. They're like Jonathan and David in the context of 1830s. Point is, like he's finding a, a, a hero who can do these horrific or bad things. And like King David had did. And then going, well, he was a man after God's own heart. I'm a, I'm, I've right. made mistakes. So like you see how this could be justified within mm-hmm. slavery in America. You can also find where people try to maybe use certain passages in the other way. A couple super chats, and then I want to plug your books. Hunter Biden's Laptops, which is my friend Jay. Can you share an example of what people of color have said? Back to kind of what we were discussing earlier. Yeah, you know, I I, I would really, I, I, I think a really great uh, place to start would be Lisa Bowen's African-American Readings of Paul. It's just such a, it's a good book, but it's um, one of the things she quotes from, um, she quotes from a petition in Boston, I think, in the late 18th century, where enslaved people are basically referring to the household cults and they're saying, well, we're Christians now, we've been baptized, and we know we have responsibilities as husbands and wives and children and parents. And if we're enslaved, then we have to obey our masters and we can't do what a husband should do to a wife or a wife should do to a husband. We can't do what a we can't do what a parent would owe a child or a child would owe a parent. So we have to obey our master. So we think that now that we're baptized, we, we, you know, we really, we really think this is a problem. It's just a beautiful example. Cause you see these uh, really smart um, people in the 18th century and they're learning some scripture and they're going, wait a minute. Like, you know, it, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful example. And just a lot of other examples of sort of Pentecostal readings of black Pentecostal readings of of Paul and just things like avenues of coming in and ways that that material has been liberatory that I wouldn't necessarily have come to myself. And now I'm like, I think I will always mention that when I teach that particular passage. And also a number of Black thinkers over the past, you know, 300 years were like, yeah, no, this is not good for, this is hierarchical and this is problematic. So um, I could give others as well, but it's, uh, there's actually uh, Emerson Powery also I've mentioned before um, his book on Genesis of Liberation. He has a really lovely book on the Good Samaritan and the way that's been read across Christian history. And so just some really, really interesting ways that story has been read, not even necessarily sometimes about slavery, sometimes not about slavery, but but the, the way that book has, the, the, that, that story has been read. So there are some, I mean, that, that's, but there are so dozens and dozens and dozens. These are scholars who are not just writing from scholarly perspectives, I'm mentioning um, Bowens and and um, Powery because they're not they're writing as scholars, but they're also taking seriously the thought worlds of Black Americans over the centuries. So wow. yes, it's really important that that we now have um, you know PhDs in Bible from people from all different backgrounds, and that we have all those different voices. But I also think it's important to hear the honor the other voices who have been reading th- these texts for hundreds of years as well. Wow! Thank you. Matthew Pop says, "Did slaves serve Jesus' disciples at Last Supper?" Oh, don't don't ruin my Easter season. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, let, oh let me please have something left. Let I me just know. say they served themselves. <laughs> it, was, it was more like a buffet, right? It was like a potluck, a buffet. I don't know, and um, I don't know, and yeah, but that's a good question. <laughs> It's, it is an interesting question. Matthew Pop, I really appreciate it. Everybody who's helped us out. Here's the book. We're, we're wrapping up. I hope that now you know who Dr. Jennifer Glancy is. I hope you go get a copy. I've got three of her books. I think that's how many you've published. You've written, I mean, you you have been involved in several other things, mm-hmm. but, and you're working on stuff now. You said you weren't going to tease us with yet, um, but yeah. yeah. Um, um, some of the stuff I'm working on is the Joseph material. So that's, that's uh, the sort of looking at slavery, looking at slavery throughout Genesis. Um, and then also looking at the way those stories are retold in the ancient world. Um, but, and if, if you have readers out there who are a good place to start is that book slavery is moral problem. It's, you know, it's sort of, uh, it's just the easiest. <laughs> 
get a copy of the book, leave a review on Amazon, help her out. We also have courses where we act, we, we record with academics and you can actually go and take the course online, 4k, all high quality. I work my butt off Dr. Glancy. I, I try to help educate and bring this stuff to the world. You can also check our uh, Patreon out and help support us there, but do us a favor, get a copy of the book, educate yourself, spread this inside everywhere. And I want to give you the last word. Before we oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. My, my last word is thank you to everyone who tuned in and who's listening. I, I just really, I, I appreciate it. And um, I appreciate the format because it enabled me to speak at length, but I also just like the little tantalizing questions that you ask. I just was like, oh, I, I wish I could talk more. And Derek, really, what a pleasure talking to you. So the final word is just thank you. Just gratitude. Well, we thank you. And I hope that we can do this in the future. Maybe when you publish on Joseph, because I yeah. love the story. I saw something interesting there. Do you have like 30 seconds? I can just, yes. okay. I thought of the Lord's supper, trying to find mimetic connections to the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. Joseph is literally running out of Potiphar's house naked. Um, he's in a dungeon. He hears two men who have a dream. I'm like really just kind of skimming here, but one is a wine bearer. The other one is a baker, both from mm -hmm. the King's household. They have, a dream. The dream is in three days, one will be condemned and head on a pike. The fowls of the air will eat his flesh, the whole nine. Ugh. The other one is you're going back into Pharaoh's house, baby, and you're going to stay alive and everything's going to be good in three days. And as he's leaving the dungeon, Joseph says, hey, 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 remember me. Remember Jesus me. says, do this in remembrance remember of me. me. Okay. Yeah. So I thought maybe you have wine, the wine bearer, you have a baker, the bread, you have do this in remembrance me in three days. Like I, I thought maybe, and notice he ends up exiting and is seated at the right hand of Pharaoh. I mean, he's like kind of like yeah. a model of Christ. So yeah. I thought maybe there's something to it. And it was interesting. I love that. I, I, that's a great insight and that's a nice little gift. So a uh, nice way to end the, when the, end the session. Love it. Thank you. And I'll see you around. If you want to stick around, I'm going to give the intro again here at the outro for people. But uh, thank you, Dr. Polizzi. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. When we hear the word slavery, Ben, we think of slavery as it existed in the American South. And as you know, that is nothing like the system that existed in ancient Israel. In ancient Israel, there was no social safety net sponsored by the state. There was no poverty program. So if a man got himself into a situation where he couldn't pay his debts, he could keep his family together and retain his self-respect by selling himself as an indentured servant to his creditor until he could work off his debts and then he would have to be set free. After seven years, he had to be set free in any case. So this was really a form of indentured servanthood. It wasn't slavery as we think of that term. This was actually an anti-poverty program. And in some respects, I think it's better than what we have in modern Western culture, which destroys families, ruins people's self-respect because they're not working. Whereas in ancient Israel, a man retained his self-respect. He worked for an income. He paid his debts. He kept his family together. And that, to call that slavery is just a gross misrepresentation. I think it's better than what we have.